Thanks, Chamber Singers. That was wonderful. And uh, I'm glad for the English translation. That's a, those are wonderful words. Uh, two more things about Fanny Crosby. I, I just uh, I love this woman. Uh, one of the things she said in her, in her adult years, she said uh, she was glad that she was blind her whole life because when she awoke in the resurrection, the first thing she would have seen, will have seen, is Jesus himself. Um, pretty cool. Uh, she, uh, she, she means a lot to my family, too, because uh, my mom, who's 94, and remembers little. Uh, in fact, she's not always clear on who I am anymore. Uh, she sometimes thinks I'm her, her, her brother, uh, who's quite old. Uh, but, you know, she can get agitated, my mom. And uh, if you have people in your life who are uh, old and suffering from dementia... Uh, you, you know what this can mean. Uh, we, we can just break into blessed assurance. And my sweet, ancient, really, really old mom uh, clicks into an, an automatic alto. She just knows alto. It's, it, she's got an alto gene. And she'll sing the whole hymn with us. And uh, so, Kevin, I, I love that hymn too. Thanks. I want you to hear the word of God from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and now is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Now the last time we met, or at least I spoke in this chapel, I said, let's get our bearings. And I like to ask that question. If you're in every first chapel of every semester, all through your career at Westmont, you will have heard this eight times. I do it always at the beginning. And the thing I want to impress on us is that we live our whole lives in the presence of God. There's a a Latin term, coram Deo, that uh, for centuries has sort of captured this. It means literally before the face of God. God's watching. Sometimes he's watching with, uh, well, with a pretty tight scrutiny. Uh, But he's also watching with great love and He's very involved, and, and the wise know this. Uh, wise people live as though that were true, because it is. And then I ask, who's here? Well, Jesus is here, and the communion of saints. Uh, there, there's a very thin veil. We, we may not be able to see through it, but in, in Christ, everyone's alive. There are, there are no dead parts in the body of Christ. And so the very Jesus who is present with us when we gather together to worship is the one in whom all are still alive who know him. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Luther and Calvin and my dad and everyone who's dead as far as our plane of existence is concerned. They're all here. And so back to that text. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that's what's, what's, what it's talking about. Uh, Those who have gone before us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, I don't know how you imagine this cloud of witnesses. I, for years, and Matt probably heard a lot of sermons on it, people sitting in the stands. They they finished the race, uh, they've done their part, and now they're up in the stands, and yes, they're they're cheering us on, but, but we're the ones running right now. I don't think that's quite right. I think they're on the field still in some mystical way, uh, like members of a relay team are. And so you run your leg, but you're not up in the stands. You're still on the field because the meaning, the, the purpose of your part of the race will not be understood until it's done for everyone. And the last lines of Hebrews 11 say as much, that, that, that their salvation Those who have died, again, we're talking about an earthly plane in space and time. Those who have died, who have gone before us, they're they're not done because we're not done. 
And John Bunyan, in his wonderful Pilgrim's Progress, has the gates of heaven opening one day, and everyone, I mean everyone, walking in together. So what do you need? Because as a pastor, I'm really concerned about, well, us, you being equipped, me being equipped to, to live this life out here at Westmont College. Uh, well, you need joy. It's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to be a student. If things go the way they usually do around here, the, the semester before us will be hard. What you need to sustain you is joy. Because joy was what sustained Jesus. Verse 2 of Hebrews 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why did Jesus come? Well, there are several one-liners you could use, but this is one of them. Why did he come and do what he did? Why did he die on the cross? He did it for joy. And the scripture says that's what sustained him. It made him even scorn the shame of the cross. Well, what is joy? Uh, there's a little history how I came to understand what joy is. And you know, if you've been around here at all, you've heard me tell this story from time to time. I love to tell the story of how I came to understand what joy was. Well, it has to do with food and uh, my favorite dish, mashed potatoes. My grandma, my mom's mom, was an incredible cook. And uh, Sunday dinner at my grandma's house, and there was always lots of family there, uh, was just always a production. And, and she was especially good at mashed potatoes. And I, I want you to know, I, I go to restaurants to this day, and I, 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 I will order an entree based on whether or not it includes mashed potatoes and gravy. And so it was Sunday at my grandma's house, and uh, the, the family was gathered around, lots of aunts and uncles, and I had positioned myself at the table, and I'm guessing I was about eight years old because the table was somewhere around here, but I had positioned myself at the plate that was placed in front of this vat of mashed potatoes. And right beside it was a bowl of gravy. And I was looking at that mountain of mashed potatoes Steam rising from the mashed potatoes and butter running in little rivers <laughs> down the sides of the mashed potatoes. You guys, butter is good. <laughs> Come on. It's not some kind of fat, you know? We should use butter as, uh, you know, you know, guy makes a great shot in basketball and say, hey, that was butter, you know? You know? <laughs> Butter's good, and I'm sitting there looking at the butter and the steam, and, and I'm, 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 I'm contemplating, what am I going to do with, with the potatoes? You, know, you, can, you, you, know, you can do different things. You can make a big lake with gravy in the middle, or you can make a, a you know, kind of a river around the potatoes. And so I'm ready for my favorite food. And uh, my grandpa asked an uncle, I'll call him Albert, uh, to pray. And I was surprised that he asked him to pray, because... Uh, I, I didn't know anything about Albert except when people talked about him, they, they tended to whisper. And as a kid, you know, when someone, you know, adults whisper about somebody, you think, well, there must be something wrong with Albert. And there was a word they used in re relation to Albert that I, I didn't know what it meant. But it must have been bad because they whispered it too. It, the word was Pentecostal. <laughs> and there was something about Pentecostal that made them all pretty nervous. So I was surprised that Albert Pentecostal was asked to pray at the dinner table. And, uh, oh, man, could this man pray? And was he happy? Oh, was he happy. He started praying. He started, as he thanked God for the food, he, he started thanking God for the hands that prepared it. And then he, he thanked God for each individual dish at the table. He got, he got so happy, he started to weep. And he, it, it kind of got sings. He was sort of singing his praise. And he was clapping his hands and weeping. And he was, he was so happy. And it went on and on and on. And all I could see was the steam on the mashed potatoes lowering and the, and the butter hardening on the sides of the mashed potatoes. And why would anybody pray that long? 
And I resented that for years. <laughs> I was disgusted, actually. But a seed of a new idea was planted in my mind, and it's this. Joy is what you experience when you're grateful for the grace that has been given you. Indeed, if one could ever take truly to heart the goodness and generosity of God, if we could really see it in, in its height and its depth and its width and its length, we might act just like Uncle Albert. If our gratitude, oh, hear me, if our gratitude could perfectly correspond to the grace that's been given us, no amount of thanksgiving could ever be excessive. Grace. Grace is God's mercy, his unearned favor. Grace is what Frederick Buechner calls the gospel's, I love this line, crucial eccentricity. It's the unique and wonderfully odd thing that God does when he forgives sinners. Not giving us the bad things we deserve, but the good things, the incredibly good things that we don't deserve. The great gospel mystery is not that sometimes bad things happen to good people, but that such a wonderfully good thing has happened to bad people, guilty and broken people who have discovered God's amazing love to be just that. Amazing. But the proof of God's love is this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And you know, real Christians have been known to get a little ecstatic over that, a little unruly. I mean, what else can one be but profoundly grateful for grace like that? Carl Barth, the Swiss theologian, has a wonderful quote about grace and gratitude. He said, how can anything more or different be asked of man? Grace and gratitude belong together like heaven and earth. Grace evokes gratitude like the voice of an echo. Gratitude follows grace like thunder, lightning. That's a great picture here. You know. Grace evokes gratitude like the voice of an echo. It's as though God, he walks over to the abyss of, of, of our fallenness and our need and our brokenness and he shouts grace down there. What comes back? Thank you, 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 right? Our gratitude follows grace like thunder follows lightning. The, the, the white light of God's grace and love, it, it, it just splits the night. And what do you get? <laughs> Thank you. And grace and gratitude and joy being what you experience when you're grateful are joined organically like, like a body. They're theologically and spiritually linked. In the Greek language, they're even related linguistically. Maybe you know this, but the words for grace, gratitude, and joy all have the same root. Car, chi alpha rho, uh, a noun that refers to health and well-being. Car is well-being. Charis is grace. Eucharistia is thanksgiving, and kara is joy. Now maybe God arranged the Greek language to illustrate my point. I don't know, but it sure gives us a picture Charis evokes Eucharistia. Eucharistia is experienced as kara. Well, you need joy to get through life well. Jesus needed joy to get through his life on earth well. And I want to propose this morning three ways that you can grow in joy. Number one, pray for it. Yeah. You know, there are nine fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. These come from God. Ask God. I know a man who every day prays that God will grow in him those nine fruit. Ask God to give you joy. Uh, another picture is from a poet George Herbert, and it mixes the metaphor a bit here, but, but he liked the idea of a, of, of, of a heart's pulse. He, he asked God to make him grateful in all circumstances, happy or sad, and these are some of my favorite lines in all of poetry. He, prays that he, he asked God to make me not thankful when it pleases me, as if thy blessings had spare days, but such a heart whose pulse may be thy praise. In other words, let, let gratitude pump through my soul the way blood pumps through my body. God's spirit moves like oxygen in the bloodstream of our souls, and so the Christian athlete, and every Christian is an athlete, spiritually, must cultivate gratitude the way a runner strengthens his heart. By what? Constant daily practice and repetition. Pray for it and then start doing it, which is number two. Practice thanksgiving. And here's the key word. Indiscriminately. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, or through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We used to joke about this passage. We called it First Hesitations, uh, 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice whenever you feel like it. Pray when the mood hits you. Give thanks from time to time. But this is not the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. It is to, okay, substitute the word indiscriminate here. Rejoice without discrimination. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Uh, maybe you've heard the name Matthew Henry. He was a great 18th century Bible scholar. Uh, he wrote this in his diary after he had been robbed. He said, and it was kind of a prayer, he said, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it wasn't much. <laughs> and fourth, because I, it was I who was robbed and not someone else. Now, here's a man who's thanking God for what he can see and for what he can't see. But, but he knows enough about the God he loves that this God makes all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Therefore, he could give thanks, even though he didn't quite understand everything. And he was determined to practice it, even when he was robbed. Now, I've, I've invented, I think I invented this. I don't know, I, I'm so old now, I, I forget where I get some of my ideas, but... Uh, uh, I, I think I invented this spiritual discipline, and you know it. Uh, I'm having a bad week or a bad month or a bad year, and uh, someone asks me how I'm doing. And there's a short version and a long version for this discipline. I want to remind you of it. It's a good one. And the long version goes like this. If I'm having a really terrible time or a season in my life, I'll say, well, other than the fact that my sins are forgiven and I'm going to spend an eternity of joy in the presence of God, I'm not doing too well. And I like the look I get. Uh, the short version is, I'm fundamentally sound. Meaning, yeah, it's, you know, the details are bad. I have cancer, you know, I don't, but, you know, I could. Uh, the job's lousy, it's not, but it might be. I mean, th all this stuff is details, really, it is. In the grand scheme of God's eternity, so no matter what happens, I'm fundamentally sound, and therefore I am, you notice the scripture commands us to rejoice. That doesn't mean you feel good, it just means you praise. And you give thanks always, indiscriminately. That's why William Law, who wrote a very serious sounding book, which he entitled, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life, 
wrote this. He said, would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It is not he who prays most or fasts most. It is not he who gives most alms or is most eminent for temperance, chastity, or justice. But it is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God wills, who receives everything as an instance of God's goodness, and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. Could you therefore work miracles? You could not do more for yourself than by this thankful spirit, for it turns all that it touches into happiness. You know, it really does. And so Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross and spit on the shame. And now is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Yeah. Pray for joy by praying prayers of thanksgiving without ceasing and indiscriminately. And thirdly, remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. Forget the gospel and you'll forget why you should give thanks always. If the gospel just becomes kind of a feature on your religious map, then you will forget. You won't know why this makes any sense whatsoever. Uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul tells a great story about this. Uh, his first year of teaching, he had 250 first-year students in his theology class. I don't know which college this was, but he uh, was right out of graduate school, and he was determined to be a demanding professor. And so he informed his students at the beginning of the semester that there would be three papers due. It was the fall semester. Uh, the 30th of September, the 30th of October, and the 30th of November. And he emphasized that on the day the paper was due, if it was not in by noon of that day, that the students would get, a, get an F on the paper. Now, you can imagine all these first-year students, they're, they have this look on their eyes like a deer caught in the headlight. Like, okay, yeah, okay. He said, you understand? Mm -hmm. You do? I do. Uh, September 30th came. 25 of the 250 students didn't have their papers. And they begged for mercy. Just a little more time, please, please, please. They were, he said, in a posture of abject humility, pleading for grace, and he gave it. But with a warning, don't let it happen again. Remember, the next assignment is due October 30th. By noon, will you do it? And they said, absolutely, professor, yes. October 30th came. And this time there were 50 students without papers. And Sproul says they stood outside the class in terror. Really, they said they hadn't budgeted their time well. It was midterms and homecoming. They were swamped. Please, please, please. One more chance, please. And he yielded again. But don't let it happen in November. And it did. On November 30th, 100 students came casually into the class minus their papers, uh, and they weren't worried in the least. They said, in effect, to Professor Sproul, chill out, don't worry about it, they'll get the papers in, we've done it in the past. Whereupon Dr. Sproul took out his little black grading book and his pen, and he asked the student, Johnson, where's your term paper? Johnson said, well, it's not ready yet. So Sproul announced he was giving him an F. He asked another student where his paper was. Greenwood, where's your paper? He didn't have it either. And he announced to the class that he was now giving Mr. Greenwood an F. And the class exploded. As one person, they shouted, that's not fair. And Sproul bristled. He said, Johnson... Did I just hear you say that's not fair? And Johnson came right back and said, yes, sir, that's not fair. And Sproul answered, okay. I don't ever want to be thought of as being unfair or unjust. Johnson, is it justice that you want? Johnson said, yes. Okay, said Sproul, if I recall, you were late the last time, weren't you? 
He said, yes, okay, I'll go back and change that grade to an F. And he erased the passing grade for October's paper and gave him an F. And he looked at the class and he said, is there anyone else who wants justice? There were no takers. Now note how their gratitude decayed. The first time they asked for mercy, they asked with a deep sense of what was at stake. They were sober, humble, and grateful when they received it. The next time, they just argued their case. A pretty good case. And there were midterms. They were freshmen. It was homecoming. It was only fair that they be cut some slack. The third time, they didn't look for mercy at all. They demanded their rights. And their premise had moved from the professor's mercy to the professor's obligation. Now, when, when gratitude goes away, and it always goes away when you forget the mercy of God, it turns into a sense of entitlement. And you forget why to be grateful. You know, David, King David, read it in the Psalms. He even talks to himself about this. He says, he says praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. He's telling himself to praise and, 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 you know, and forget not his benefits, such as he forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Don't forget it, my soul. So say it over and over again. Cultivation of memory was important to Jesus, too. He told us to eat a meal, to break the bread, and to drink the wine in remembrance of me. You get it? At the heart of Christian worship, at the most sacred point of Christian worship, is a meal meant to stimulate memory. And at that meal, we remember two things, our great sinfulness and misery, and the price Christ's great love paid on the cross to forgive and save us. Bread is broken. This is my body. Blood is poured out. This is my blood. Well, ask God to save you from ingratitude. Because only by gratitude will you have joy. Cultivate it. Practice it. Be indiscriminate and remember the gospel. It's not complicated. It really isn't. Uh, it's any time you gather to worship. It's any time you get with your Christian friends. It's any time you sit alone to listen to the voice of God. It reminds me, and I close with this, of uh, the first European explorers of South America. Uh, they'd be out in the doldrums along the equator and they would drift into the mouth of the Amazon River. You know, the Amazon River is something. You, you, it, its current can be detected 200 miles out. Its mouth is somewhere around 90 miles across. And these sailors, dying of thirst, would, would drift into the fresh water of the Amazon, thinking they were still at sea. And occasionally, the, the natives would, would paddle out in their boats. And, and though they didn't know the language, the, uh, the sailors would, 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 by hand motions, ask, where's some water we can drink? And the natives would laugh, and they'd go, lower your bucket. It's not complicated. Be thankful. Practice gratitude. Stimulate your memory. Thank God for the things you see and the things you don't see. Do it all the time. And it will sustain you. I promise you, it will sustain you by the power of the Holy Spirit who makes us grateful. Let's pray. So Lord, you've given us ample reason to be thankful, so you command us to, to do it. Lord, we will. Remind us to do it. 
Give us grace to do it. Open our eyes to see the width and length and the height and the depth of your love. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are dismissed.